The Teaching of the Master by Brother L. G. Sargent Part 4, Chapter 6, The Essentials of Life Matthew 6, verses 11 to 12 and 14 to 15 Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The first of the group of petitions, which are more directly for ourselves, recognizes physical need as the basis of spiritual life. In Sheol, where there is no remembrance of God and none can give him thanks, there can certainly be no fellowship with him, and where there is no life there can be no growth. Therefore the prayer acknowledges our dependence on God for the very elements of that existence which is the foundation of all our consciousness, and therefore of all our knowledge, faith, love, and hope, therefore of all chance of developing character fit for God's kingdom. This simple view is not always accepted, for the greatest linguistic controversy to which the prayer has given rise has revolved for many centuries round the word rendered daily. Does the expression mean bread for today, bread for the coming day, bread of subsistence, needful bread, or continual bread? Or are we to carry it right out of the realm of the material and understand it as spiritual food, the food of eternal life? That the last name view should find many advocates is not surprising among those who start from the postulate of the immortality of the soul. The fact that man is dust-formed, living soul, returning to the dust, alone provides true ground for understanding this petition. The difficulty is that the word occurs only in the two records of the prayer, and nowhere else in Greek literature. Oregon in the third century thought it was coined by the apostles. As Oregon was presumed to know his own tongue better than anyone later could do, his statement that it did not exist before was generally accepted. It did not occur to commentators that Oregon might have been too academic to know the Greek of the marketplace. In recent years, however, much study has been made of fragments of papyri from Egypt which reveal the use of colloquial Greek near the first century AD, a vernacular much modified from the classic Greek of an earlier age, and a common tongue in use among all the varied peoples of the Roman Empire. Adolf Diesman has been able to record the finding of the words ta episiusa, in a papyrus from Fayum, which he described as the remains of a housekeeper's book. This expression, he said, corresponded with the Latin diarrhea, which occurred in a similar list of household requisites in a Latin wall inscription in Pompeii. Both words probably signify the amount of daily food given to slaves, soldiers, and labourers and probably usually allotted a day beforehand. On the ground of this research, Diesman says, The strict meaning of the prayer is, Give us today our amount of daily food for tomorrow. There is a striking parallel to the idea, though not to the term, in Luke 12, verse 42. Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season. It is precisely for such supplies in due season that the member of the household of God asks in prayer. 
we ask to be saved, not only from starvation, but from continual uncertainty where the next meal is coming from. For in that state it is beyond human nature to retain a quiet mind, and we dare not challenge such a strain on the flesh we know to be so weak. Nor, on the other hand, may we beg for a distant security or a sewered wealth when grace is sufficient for us. We only ask for the coming day. Can then those who happen to possess this world's goods join equally in this petition with others? Yes, first, because all stand equal as brethren before the Lord, praying not only for themselves, but for one another. And secondly, woe betide any if they forget that rich and poor alike depend on God for their daily needs. Wealth is largely a social fiction. A turn of the stock market, a collapse of currency, let alone a Marxist revolution. And it may vanish in a day. A shower of bombs and the most solid possessions can be destroyed. Modern wealth is not less but more vulnerable than ancient forms which suffered the slow attack of moth and rust. Ye know not what shall be on the morrow. Have not the words of James gained new poignancy for us in two world wars? The rich man, therefore, has as much need to ask as the poor, and he may only ask for his portion in due season as a household servant. All he has beyond that is an added trust from God to be used in love to God and his neighbour. From the first need of all life, the prayer passes to the basic need of spiritual life. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Men cannot live before God apart from his forgiveness, for without it they cannot be in fellowship with him, and without that fellowship they cannot ultimately live at all. And they cannot be given the forgiveness of God, nor can they genuinely accept it, unless in their own contrition of heart they are willing to forgive. For God to forgive the unforgiving would not only be contrary to his righteousness, it would be a moral impossibility. The unforgiving spirit is a sign of the unbroken heart which does not know its need, and like hard-baked clay, will allow mercy neither to flow out nor to flow in. Once again, the prayer searches human nature to the very core, making demands on those who will repeat it, before which they stand abashed. We know that we need not so much exposition to tell us what it means as the power in frail flesh to carry it out. The term debts, however, opens up an illuminating train of thought to which the way has been pointed by Dr. Thurtle. The law provided for remission of debt in the Lord's name at the very end of every seven years, when every creditor that lendeth aught unto his neighbour shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbour or of his brother, because it is called the Lord's release, Deuteronomy 15, verse 2. Servitude was also limited by the seven-year period, and seven such heptades led to the year of jubilee, with its general proclamation of liberty and restoration to family ownership of land which had been sold. The economic and social life of Israel rested on the principle that all land, the basis of wealth, was vested in the crown, that is, God, and was held upon a tenure which, by forbidding freehold sale and limiting the terms of leasehold sale, was designed to maintain the distribution of land in family holdings. Linked with this remarkable system of land tenure was the periodic release from debt. Both were parts of a single economy which, had the law been faithfully observed, would have prevented social inequalities by keeping wealth widely distributed. 
and this unique solution of a problem which still baffles the wisdom of men was only possible because it rested on a moral principle that what they had was not their own but God's. Illuminated by that truth, the economy of Israel was the only one in the world to enshrine among its fundamentals the principle of forgiveness. This principle Jesus carries over into the realm of spiritual life, and he illustrates it by the parable of the unmerciful servant, in which the debt the servant refuses to forgive is so paltry, and the debt he has been forgiven is so overwhelming. We turn to the cross once more for the supreme example of the meaning of the prayer, that cross from which the word is uttered, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Peter, fiery Peter, reflects his Lord's thought in saying to the Jews, Brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. When we use this petition, we ask God to pass by our indebtedness to him as in the year of release, in such manner that the account can never again be presented for payment. And we ask it knowing not only the magnitude of the debt, but the majesty of the divine creditor. For two other terms are used as synonyms with it, which show the nature of our indebtedness. The petition is the only one on which Jesus directly comments in the context of the prayer in Matthew, and there he speaks of trespasses. The same word is used repeatedly by Paul in Romans 5, but not as the offence so also is the free gift, etc. And also in Ephesians 2 verse 5 and Colossians 2 verse 13 in the expression dead in sins. In Luke's version of the prayer, the petition reads, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Debts, trespasses, sins are therefore all used to describe the relation in which human nature stands to God and from which it needs release. And yet those who pray in these terms do not come to God as unregenerate sinners. Granted the one great remission when they take on themselves the name of Christ, they still need, in the frailty of human nature, continual forgiveness for shortcomings. But they can only ask it as the reborn who know and acknowledge God's law, the law of the Lord's release. At the same time, God's forgiveness is not simply a wiping clean of the slate. If it were, prayer would be immoral, a mere incantation to bring about a magical result. And we need to be continually wary of the pagan conception which would reduce it to such a level. Repentance is the recognition of the need for change within ourselves and of the divine love which can effect it. To ask forgiveness is to lay ourselves open to the cleansing fire of God's grace that it may burn up the chaff. The psalmist proves the nerve of it when, after praying for the blotting out of transgression, he writes, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. God binds us closer to himself by our very weakness. We must needs depend on his grace, not only to bring us into his fellowship, but to maintain us in it. By repentance and renewed effort we grow in grace, rising on stepping stones of our dead selves. But his forgiveness is the necessary condition of that growth. The Pharisaic mind that does not know its need of forgiveness does not know its need of God. It is therefore cut off from the very source of life and dead while it lives. God cleanses the heart by contrition. 
and if the prayer does not directly ask for our hearts to be made pure, it is because the thought of the psalmist is included in the petition, Forgive. The act of praying for forgiveness demands an understanding of the mind of him who forgives. When we throw ourselves on the mercy of God, our pride, our self-sufficiency, our self-assertiveness are broken down in the knowledge of our need and of his pity towards them that fear him. Do we re-erect those thorny barriers when we turn to our fellow men? Or do we reflect towards them some gleam of his mercy and compassion? It has been said that the Christian doctrine of forgiveness is so drastic and so difficult, where there is a real and deep en injury to forgive, that only those living in the Spirit, in union with the cross, can dare to base their claims on it. 